Part 3 The Alternative Living Unscripted Part 3 Author's Objective Vision To illustrate what is possible when your life is free from scripted expectations and how to start crafting your own vision of that existence. Chapter 13 The Unscripted Life Fuck you! Wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. Epictetus, philosopher. Describing indescribable the five fuck you freedoms. In Hollywood's The Matrix, the world is fooled by a neural simulation while carnivorous machines feed on our life force. Similarly in our world, government feeds on our economic output our consumptive impetuses and our consensus ignorance. Corporations play the foot soldiers, herding the unwashed into the machine's mouth while the hyper-realities keep us entertained and distracted. Hopefully your blinders are off and you see the paradigm of compliance. Hopefully you are awake and now know that you have been sold a bullshit story by a bunch of bullshitters whose only goal is to keep you knee-deep in bullshit. And unlike a fictional movie, cleansing yourself from the bullshit isn't as easy as swallowing a red pill. You can't stop using money, paying your taxes, or interacting with a hyper-distracted world. The good news, however, is that the script has an escape through unscription, a life-changing subset of thought and action underwritten by entrepreneurship. What can unscripted do for you? Tough question. Wordsmithing an unscripted existence free from M.O.D.E.L. citizenship is like trying to capture the ooze and ass of the Grand Canyon with a late 70s Polaroid. Like a near-death experience, words cannot accurately express unscription. All I can do is paint a picture from my experience and hope you can use it to craft a vision for yourself. As for that picture, I suppose now would be a good time for me to shamelessly brag about all my stuff you know, the garage full of European supercars, the imported exotic Ming Dynasty vases, and my haute couture wardrobe complete with leather embroidered dragons and silken flaming swords. Oh, and let's not forget my favorite gadget, my Wi-Fi enabled refrigerator with an authentic monate embedded in the door. But you know what? I won't do any such thing. You see, I don't own any of this crap. The truth is, unscripted is about what you don't have versus what you do have. Unscripted is self-actualized freedom by exclusion and excommunication. Don't confuse this with minimalism or being a waitstaff stiffing cheapskate. Unscripted entrepreneurs live well by choice, not by necessity. Well is whatever you want, whether Teslas are preferred over Toyotas or Ferraris over Fords. I'm not here to define your fulfillment picture. I won't tell you that you need $100 million or $8 million to make it happen. My happiness is not yours. I'm only here to give you the blueprint for making it happen and making it happen as fast as possible. With that said, if I had to paint unscripted with one color, it would be the color of fuck you. Yup, fuck you. Being charged an arm and leg for a mortgage. Fuck you. I will pay cash. Need to work next weekend and miss the kids playoff game. Fuck you. I quit. Stock market sinking and threatening retirement. Fuck you. The stock market doesn't fund my retirement. Can't go on vacation until someone gives permission. Fuck you. I leave tomorrow. Can't wear that cool outfit on casual Fridays. Fuck you.
I'm wearing only underwear all day. Don't like how your kids are being educated? Fuck you and your school. I'm homeschooling my kid. Don't like your annual 2% pay raise? Fuck you. I will make 200% more next year. As fuck you implies, unscripted is about pure, unadulterated life and liberty. Life means owning your time and thoughts while curating your existence. It is not just to be but to become. The fuck you of liberty has five primary freedoms. They are Freedom from work Freedom from scarcity and fiscal constraint Freedom from hyperrealistic influence Freedom from hope and dependence Freedom from ordinary and routine. Ek freedom from work. I successfully executed an unscripted plan in multiple instances and hence I don't need to work another day in my life. Indentured time has been eliminated. I don't need to write books, start another company or wake up by force every weekday morning. Theoretically, I retired nearly 35 years early. Still every day is payday. Every day is Saturday. Every day is owned every second and every hour are mine. Fundamentally, I am as rich in time as Bill Gates or any other billionaire. You see, to be free from the necessity of work is like releasing a caged bird and unleashing the world as your playground. This liberation opens you to experimentation, spontaneity, clarity of action and purpose without fiscal measurement, interference or influence. In other words, my life's work honors my soul, not some third party, thought leader in a position of authority. Take this book, for instance. What do you think crucifying the trillion dollar financial industry will do to my book sales? I will make an educated guess that no one in the financial world would dare recommend unscripted, let alone review it favorably. You see, if book sales or money were my driving influence as an author, I'd tell you that the best investment is a 401k and a Vanguard mutual fund. I'd tell you MLM is the best business model and everyone should do it. One opinion is the voice of necessity, a compromised integrity in lieu of putting bends in the garage and the other is the voice of unscripted. And yet I still work. Why? Because it's a part of my life's meaning and purpose. Because it's my choice and not a force-fed exhibition, work rarely feels like work. Yeah, it's fun. And get this, I still earn a full-time CEO salary for a part-time effort. Unscripted transforms the world into one simple choice, will you? Or won't you? 2. Freedom from scarcity and fiscal constraint In early 2014, I dropped seven figures plus on a beautiful home in Fountain Hills, Arizona. I could do a Cribs video and talk about its many great amenities, but doing so is tantamount to scripted Dutch baggery. Instead, I'd like to talk about what it doesn't have. It doesn't have a mortgage. I told the bank fuck you and paid cash. Outside of maintenance and operating expenses, such as insurance and utilities, my basic living expenses can be paid with an income considered poverty in most states. No rent payment, no mortgage payment, no interest payment, no private mortgage insurance, never again for life. Likewise, it doesn't have cars in the garage with payments attached. I don't need leases or loans. 
No, whatever cars are parked are paid for. Some have tremendous miles and make no statements in traffic other than that I need to get from point A to point B. Others may come and go and are very expensive, Italian, rarely driven and symbolic of the unscripted path I have taken. What would your life look like without a house or a car payment? And my favorite feature of homeownership? My home is free from the Gestapo Hoa, better known as your trusty neighborhood homeowners association. If you are not familiar with Hoas, they are composed of multiple jackasses posing as humans, telling you what you can and cannot do with your house. Want to paint your house? You need permission. Fly a flag on your front steps. Permission. Don't get permission and get fined or, worse, have a lien slapped on your house. I cannot tell you how happy I am knowing some loser cut from the varsity football team 40 years ago can't tell me the appropriate trim height for my bushes. But perhaps my favorite liberation is escaping the financial straitjacket while giving scarcity the middle finger, including the authors and bloggers who pitch it. Ah, the beauty of not being mindfucked by money. It means dinner is a nice steak found at a nice steakhouse, not roadkill you found on Interstate 10. It means liberated shopping at whole paycheck, with smug impunity, price and sale considerations ignored, not hauling a wad of coupons so thick that George Costanza would drop his jaw. It means flushing the toilet every shit, not rationing flushes every six dumps because, OMG, you'll save 89 cents on every flush. And my favorite, the exhilaration of walking into Starbucks, and buying whatever you want without hearing lectures about compound interest tables and how much that five buck coffee would grow if you just saved it while waiting for the invention of boat grind. Teen Freedom from Hyperrealistic Influence One day I climbed into my truck and caught a glimpse of some papers jammed in between the seat and the center console. Now, if you ever hitched a ride in my car, you'd conclude that I'm a slob, or at least, I chauffeur one. Riding shotgun is like box seats at the county landfill without the cracker jack. Anyway, after starting the engine and lifting an eyebrow at the trash in my passenger well, some official-looking papers caught my eye. I grabbed them and took a look. OMG! What I found was an emotional mixed bag, first, shock, then happiness, and then fear. Buried in those papers, buried in my car was a check for $11,000. The check sat lost in my car for weeks, not cashed, not missed, and not needed. Shocking? Yes? Happy? You bet! I can't tell you how incredible it is to be debt-free without need, want or desire. The fear? The check totally slipped my mind. Alzheimer's is a family friend, and let's just say, my memory rivals a Commodore 64. The takeaway? Had I been bewitched by the consumer hyper-reality? that $11G would have been spent the minute it hit my hands. If my priority was slaughtering the Joneses or some flamboyant Instagram playboy, I would have spent my millions on a bunch of junk that screamed, hey, look at me and my cool stuff. The lesson is, I haven't pissed away my freedom playing the consumer con game. I didn't capitulate to the latest in German engineering and didn't buy the latest iPhone only to have it replaced a year later. Instead, that $11,000 was parked in a seat crevasse and never thought about again. Perhaps my favorite hyperrealistic immunity is from trivial distraction. 
In June of 2014, Yahoo's front page announced that breakout pop star Iggy Azalea's video, Fancy, surpassed 100 million views. At the same time, sectarian war broke out in Iraq. Ukraine was on the verge of a Russian invasion. And yet, Yahoo had nary a peep. As for the urgent matters that besiege the American idiocracy, namely Iggy's hundred million views, I'm proud to admit I was not one of them. The very definition of unscripted means not being influenced by scripted trivialities. Pop culture, celebrity worship, and pro athletes are no contest to the life I'm leading. For example, ask me who won the World Series last year. I don't know. And if you told me, I wouldn't remember. Why? Because I don't give a fuck. I don't care that some millionaire athlete threw an interception and lost the football game in the fourth quarter. While I respect pro athletes for their process, I pay attention to their livelihoods as much as they pay attention to mine. My life is too short, too important, and too valuable to get wrapped up in scripted zombification. And finally, another hyperrealistic immunity is its bullshit detector. You see, when Dillian, a long-lost friend, sends me a Facebook message crusading for some ground floor opportunity that's gonna make him rich, the BS thermometer spits mercury. His words are peppered with phony platitudes, excited emoticons, and stories of free BMWs that aren't really free but least. Funny and sad, but no worries. I'm immune because I know the difference between entrepreneurship and a direct sales job in a network marketing company. I know the difference between leading the charge and being led by a charge. I know the difference between the scripted seeking shortcuts and the unscripted targeting those seeking shortcuts. But my unscripted immunity doesn't end there. Rid of influence, I'm a human shield impervious to scripted dogmatisms and their ubiquity. It's like walking the planet uninfected amidst a zombie pandemic. Oh gracious, look there, another financial article authored by a non-millionaire telling me how to become a millionaire. In the scripted sandhu it's perfectly acceptable, like taking fitness advice from a fat dude who hasn't seen a gym since the Bush administration. But the fairy tales and unicorns have just started. Look, it's another financial guru dispensing another fiscal hypocrisy of do what I say, not what I do. I chuckle. I shake my head. And then my humanity hits me with sadness. People buy the lies and pay for it with their lives. 4. Freedom from hope and dependence Unscripted means unbinding from hope and dependence as a financial plan. It's a simple truth, fuck you, freedoms cannot be ascribed by dependence or hope. The source is irrelevant. Living in your parents' house. Dependent. Living off the government's nipple. Dependent. Is your lifestyle tied to a job and the income it provides? Sorry, dependent. Is your retirement locked into a 50-year marriage with Wall Street? Or how well the stock market performs? Again, sorry, dependent. Within the scripted OS, the holy trinity of retirement planning is tied to three unpredictable and uncontrollable markets, the job market, the stock market, and the housing market. In other words, follow the script and your financial future is resigned to the gambles of dependence. Adopt conventional thinking in this area, and I guarantee, you will live conventionally. 
The truth is, the unscripted don't rely on these markets for creating wealth. Nope, none of them. Less than 2% of my net worth comes compliments of any of these markets. As I write this, I own a few stocks, and it's only because they pay dividends. Being free from market shenanigans means something I hold very dear, I can give them the big fuck you. Stock market up? Down? Who the hell cares? I don't give a shit because the stock market is not my vehicle for wealth. And the ultimate irony? I don't own an era or a 401k traditionally espoused retirement vehicles and yet I retired decades early. Oh Lord, how could that be? You see, the unscripted understand the difference between the uncontrollable limited leverage depend on the job stock housing market for decades and pray to God and controllable unlimited leverage invest in a business system I create and control. Punch freedom from ordinary. A final unscripted liberation is to be pardoned from the death sentence of ordinary and routine. As I mentioned, one of my meaningless jobs after college was driving limousines in the Chicago suburbs. While that sounds glamorous, it wasn't. The only difference between me and a taxi driver was six feet of legroom, a shelf full of liquor, and a privacy door, or as I call it, the porn door. Anyhow, this meaningless job wasn't so meaningless after all. For most days, I partook in the race of rats, with me as their driver. I saw routine on a daily basis. One of my usual customers was an executive who would fly out Monday morning and return Thursday night. Despite driving this man nearly every week, we rarely spoke other than pertinent information. Rarely a greeting, never a conversation, only a word or two sometimes sprinkled in with a nod. Misery and scorn etched his morning face whenever I picked him up at his Barrington mansion. During rides to the airport, chats on his brick phone were occasional, the conversations callous, sometimes ruthless. Then one Monday morning after I picked him up, something different happened. He broke routine. He actually engaged me in a cheerful conversation. He learned I had two business degrees and was an aspiring entrepreneur. I learned he was a lawyer with a wife and two kids. During the 30-minute drive to the airport, I wondered why now is Mr. Misery talking to me. As I drove into the airport, I found out why he was meeting his wife and kids in Hawaii for vacation. Welcome to Routine Ur. I should say, breaking routine. Unscripted is liberation from cultural norms and patterns of existence that don't serve your happiness. Such patterns are the traffic commute, the ride on the bus, the train or the drive in the car. The 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and the Sunday blues scarred by foreboding and discontent. The once a year vacation, the one that finally allows you to break, speak to a stranger, and crack a smile. The daily routine of waking up at subha ke paanch baje to a song you once loved, not think tie, working as you are told, driving home, microwaving dinner, watching the latest flavor of reality TV, and then repeating endlessly till your funeral. Freedom from ordinary releases you from the cognitive clutter of scripted standards by which you are measured, your car, your job, your college degrees, your house, your social media posts, and yes, even your appearance. If you are one of the 5000 people that follow me on my personal Facebook page, you'll notice something unusual, I rarely post anything. No politics, religion, or sports team crap. 
No gym photos or pictures of my healthy me. The truth is I care more about the real me than a crafted, social media me, so real me gets my attention. In a similar vein, when you are unbound from ordinary, societal norms can't tell you how to dress or groom. You own your own style. As I write this, my hair is halfway down my back. Yes, it's that long, and I haven't lost it. Madam, can I get you a drink? I hear that a lot when I dine out. From behind, I have been mistaken for a woman. When the server faces me and sees a man, hilarity ensues. The girlfriend finds it amusing. I don't. The point is, I haven't cut my hair because I don't need to cut my hair. There is no employee handbook I have to follow, giving me the freedom to roll like Axe Rose, minus the shrilly voice and goofy hip gyrations. Likewise, I don't own a tie, why would I waste money on something I hate wearing? Heck, I don't even own an expensive shirt. My day-to-day -day attire is gym clothes. The last time I had a public speaking gig, I showed up in jeans and a t-shirt. I wear what's comfortable. If the audience wants to ignore me because my shoes aren't Ferragamo and my suit isn't Armani, well that audience would be in the wrong room and listening to the wrong speaker. The unscripted TLDR do, wear, buy, live, and pursue whatever you want. It's a beautiful way to live. But will you even make it to the starting line? Let's find out. Try imagining an existence rich in the five freedoms. What would you be doing and where? What would you not be doing, wearing, or watching? Chapter 14 Fuck this before, fuck you. You can avoid reality, but you cannot avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. Ayan Rand Othar The beginning of the end, the fuck this event, FTE. Ever since The Matrix was released in 1999, the red pill has become symbolic for many things, transformation, awakening, knowledge, freedom, and the not-so-obvious, the painful road of unplugging from ordinary. As much as I'd like to be writing about rainbows, I cannot. Jim Rohan, the legendary motivational speaker, once said, we must all suffer one of two things, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. At some point you will face the same choice, a life in hell a scripted hyper-reality fated by the treadmill of mediocrity, or a walk through hell, the red pill reality of discipline, unpaid sacrifice, and dangit, a tone of failure. The fuck this event, FTE, is your first step into this hell. And no, it won't be a leisurely stroll through a blooming wheat field with a triumphant Hans Zimmer melody orchestrating the background. Cigars won't be lit and champagne won't be popping. Instead, the fuck this event is a traumatic moment, epiphanic and painful. It's a pejorative mental breakthrough, one that sounds like any of the following no more. I have had it or I can't live like this. The FTE smacks you when the pain of the status quo finally exceeds the anticipated pain of its escape, the point of no return where nothing else matters. If awareness was a slow boil leading to this book, the FTE is a sudden flash burn of WTFU and GTFO. In a June 2014 essay penned for Worth magazine, Mohammad Elerian explained his reasoning behind his resignation as CEO of the investment firm PIMCO. In his essay, he cited his daughter for the reason. When Elerian asked his daughter why she wouldn't brush her teeth and do as told, 
she produced a list of 22 milestones her father missed due to his workload. From her first day at school to a first soccer match to a Halloween parade, the list was exhaustive, enough to cause Elerian to rethink his priorities. He wrote, talk about a wake-up call. I felt awful and got defensive. I had a good excuse for each missed event. Travel, important meetings, an urgent phone call, sudden to-dos. But it dawned on me that I was missing an infinitely more important point, 26. Unfortunately, and unlike Mr. Elerian, your FTE won't be accompanied by a dollar million nest egg and a 22-point list from your 10-year-old daughter but something more disruptive. Like a curt letter from Human Resources, that you famistically says, Thank you for the last 15 years, but your services are no longer required, security will escort you out of the building. The FTE could come from a rickety cot with a spring piercing your spine, you are stranded by weather at an airport thousands of miles away from home, a revelation that once again, your child lacks a father, and your wife lacks a husband. And let's hope your FTE doesn't come from an oncologist's office, a negative biopsy, a relieved reminder that you have one life and it might be over quicker than expected. While my fuck this event was more than 20 years ago, it forever seared my mind. I was 26, four years removed from college and working as a chauffeur in Chicago. My work day started like the other six days before it. It was an ungodly hour for a morning drop at O'Hare Airport. This morning was worse. The client photo was Ruth Stafford, an old leathery hag from the Hillary Clinton School of Fashion. She wore the same burgundy floral pantsuit on every trip. I'd guess Ruth deployed this ensemble no matter the occasion. Funeral? Wedding? Jazzercise? Floral pantsuit? We nicknamed the perpetual pantsuit lady, Ruth Stif Ford, because she'd tip one dollar, regardless of conditions. Drive Ruth through a nuclear apocalypse or the eye of a hurricane and well enjoy your buck, kiddo. Throw in a heavy snow forecast, and what's left is a grueling day for shadow. Anyhow, 12 hours and hundreds of gridlocked miles later, I was still working. By nightfall, a steady snow turned into a blinding blizzard. After I delivered my last client home, I tried to do the same, but the blizzard had other ideas. Roads were closed. Visibility spotty. Frustrated, I pulled the limousine to the shoulder of the road and parked. I faced myself in an airy silence. Ashamed. Disquieted. Hopeless. My cold socks, damped from hauling luggage all day, heckled my anguish. The disheartening truth was clear, wiped me from the face of the planet and no one outside family would care. I was a nobody. My two business degrees, a waste. My impressive college GPA, earned years earlier, didn't mean jack. My dead-end job was just a merry-go-round keeping the bills paid until next month. As I sat there, dazed and deadened by the sullen rhythmic hum of the windshield wipers, I confessed my life was a train wreck and I was sick of the failure in the mirror. I was sick of cursing the alarm clock at 4 a.m. I was sick of chauffeuring drunk bachelors, spoiled prom brats, and corporate executives. I was sick of enduring cold winters and humid summers while watching my life rot away in traffic. I was sick of being outcast by my friends as we had nothing left in common. They talked about their jobs, cars, and two-bedroom townhouses, 
I talked about my entrepreneurial dreams. I was sick of my life's movie, a movie that no one would want to watch, and despite my preparation, the script was still camped in the director's chair. And that's when I considered ending my life. And that's when everything changed. Something needed to change, and that something was me. FTEs are memorable and often unmistakable. If you are unsure of yours, more than likely you have not had one. Faking fuck this. As you are reading, you might be thinking, I have already had my fuck this event. If true, congratulations. Unfortunately, most people think they had a fuck this event but haven't. What really happened was a fuck this moment, a temporary, irritating slap to the face, but nothing forceful enough to get you off your ass. It's like that old folk tale about the lazy dog lying in a gas station. Day after day, the dog lies there whimpering and moaning. After hearing the dog whimper every visit, a customer asks the clerk, Hey, what's wrong with the dog? The clerk responds, Oh, he is just lying on a nail and it hurts. Confused, the customer asks, Then why doesn't he get up? The clerk retorts, I guess it just doesn't hurt bad enough. The truth is, you will have many moments in life that seem like fuck this events, but they aren't. A fake FTE is temporary, sometimes lasting only hours, sometimes days. A true FTE shifts interest to commitment. It pummels excuses into submission. It's unbalancing where nothing else matters and priorities shift. Xboxes are thrown in the attic, cable TV is cancelled and credit cards are paid. You see, most people are interested in entrepreneurship, financial freedom and success but most never commit. Why? It just doesn't hurt bad enough. There is only one way to tell the difference between a fake FTE and a real FTE. A fake FTE has four threats and any one of them will send you right back to the script. A real FTE has no threats, to breathe or not to breathe isn't a conscious choice, it just happens. Threat 8. Mediocre Comfort a real FTE doesn't care about mediocre comfort. Give a man an okay job that pays just enough to provide mediocre comfort and I will show you a man that will keep his job indefinitely. This is by design. In 1926, in an interview published by World's Work magazine, industrial titan Henry Ford confesses why he reduced his workers' labor load from 6 days and 48 hours to 5 days and 40 hours, all while keeping pay the same. He said, It is the influence of leisure on consumption which makes the 5-day work week so necessary. The people who consume the bulk of goods are the people who make them. That is a fact we must never forget, that is the secret of our prosperity. He continued, The people with a panch day week will consume more goods than the people with a chai day week. People who have more leisure must have more clothes. They must have a greater variety of food. They must have more transportation facilities. They naturally must have more service of various kinds. This increased consumption will require greater production than we now have. Instead of business being slowed up because the people are off work, it will be speeded up. This will lead to more work. And this to more profits. Satais. Still accepted, the modern 5-day, 40-hour workweek is a scripted tool for obedience, keeping you occupied, clothed, and fed, 
and it's just enough to keep weekends earmarked as a leisurely celebration officiated by consumption. As long as your head stays slightly above water, the weekend bribe continues while the red pill swirls around in your mouth like a jolly rancher. I see this every day, and no, I'm not exaggerating. While my first book created some life-altering fuck this events for my readers, in all honesty, it also created many failed fuck this moments. Hit the introduction section at thefastlaneforum.com and you'll witness page after page of them. I'm so excited to begin. In 30 days, I will post everything I have done. Goodbye job. Hello entrepreneur. And then, bam. 24 hours later, they are gone, never heard from again. Their grandiose declaration, meaningless. Instead of a true scripted disconnection, they reconnect back to their job, their existing paradigm, and their spectacular weekend. The problem is, these people like the idea of entrepreneurship as much as they like the idea of winning free money. But they don't honor the effort or expectation required to make it real. For example, I had a college buddy who always talked entrepreneurship. Let's call him Willie. Willie gets a job helping him fund his entrepreneurial dreams, you know, so he can pay bills and meet his obligations. After getting a decent paying job, Willie starts accumulating surplus cash. Instead of saving it or investing it into his business, he buys a new jeep and a townhouse in a hot city district. The next thing you know, Willie is job trapped, as it's needed to fund his lifestyle. From the moment of his first paycheck, Medirokar comfort ensues, justified and entrapped by I have responsibilities. Willie's entrepreneurial dreams pay the price. But hey, at least he has a nice jeep with only 45 payments remaining. Translation A Willie is owned by his junk and the mediocre comfort it provides. He isn't willing to risk or sacrifice comfort in hopes of something better. Translation though Willie doesn't need entrepreneurship as much as he needs comfort. And entrepreneurship doesn't need him. Similarly, a lot of fathers on my forum expressed concern that their teenage children have zero interest in entrepreneurship. Even the teenage boy in my life isn't interested in entrepreneurship and it doesn't surprise me. Why? Because they haven't experienced a shitty boss, a shitty job or a shitty commute. When you experience how much the system sucks firsthand, the desire appears. Warning people about a hot fire doesn't work, they need to feel the burn for themselves. The problem in these instances is mediocre comfort, enough of it that it prevents you from getting up off the nail. The nice car, the regular paycheck, the fun weekend of football games, all of it keeps you at the poker table with the same strategy, the same bets, and the same cards. In the end, nothing changes but the passage of time. At some point you have to decide what's more important. Your unscripted dreams. Or watching the Yankees' third game on a 10-game homestand. Your long-term happiness. Or your drunken stupors at the lake on Saturday afternoon. Threat to your guarded pride and ego. A real FT overcomes an insulated ego. I was a C student in high school, but in college I earned two business degrees, won scholarships, and graduated near the top of my class. Despite such accolades, I was willing to do anything to make my entrepreneurial dreams happen. That included washing dishes, driving cabs, mopping floors, and flipping burgers. 
You see, I wasn't too good not to do the dirty work. My dreams were stronger than my pride and ego. If you are too cool and fear what your friends and family might think because you are waiting tables down at the Applebee's, you are probably not cut from an entrepreneurial cloth. I once tweeted that if you are not willing to take a minimum wage job, you are not willing to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs can go weeks, sometimes months, without getting paid. Are you willing to make that sacrifice? If you aren't willing to work for the minimum, how can you expect to work for nothing? My forum is crammed with people too proud, too cool and too good to work a shit job. Some are even too cool to get a real job. And you know what? These proud souls will never succeed as entrepreneurs, let alone get out of the gates of a scripted existence. Had I been too cool to run a limo company for an absentee owner, I would have never learned the inside scoop about the business leading to my first successful company. The plague of too cool was seen during Ashton Kutcher's acceptance speech at the 2013 Teen Choice Awards. He said, I believe that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. When I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in grocery store Delhi. And then I got a job in factory sweeping Cheerio dust off the ground. And I have never had a job in my life that I was better than. I was always just lucky to have a job. And every job that I had was a stepping stone to my next job, and I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. Atthais. Epic speech, no doubt. Epic crowd reaction, not so much. As Mr. Kuchar voiced this life wisdom, the crowd didn't care to hear it. No raucous applause. No standing ovation. The crowd of mostly teens, surely mesmerized by Ashton's hyper-personality, sandwiched his hard work speech with crickets. Chirp, chirp. Of course being sexy and cool was met with screams and catcalls. Clearly our youngsters are more interested in big breaks and overnight success than they are about sweeping floors and washing dishes. Threat teen I have responsibility. Are you in deep? In deep is a phrase I use when I hear someone deeply entrenched in scripted living. It refers to someone who is so overwhelmed with responsibility, debt and consumption that scripted disconnection is nearly impossible. Their burdens have them paralyzed, and only a real FTE can change it. For example, every so often during an interview, I'm asked if I have any advice for someone with four ex-wives, 17 kids from six different women, nine credit cards, two new cars, and a bad job. Really? Not sure I have any advice? at least the type of advice you'd want to hear. How about keep your damn pants zipped? Quit buying shit with money you don't have. Make better choices? With such a robust personal resume, this person doesn't have a money problem, he has a decision-making problem. And until that changes, nothing will change, no matter what my advice is. A real AFT burns bridges and forces change, a fake one does not. The cold-hearted fact is, the more responsibilities assumed, the stronger the scripted grip becomes. Responsibility can be the yoke of many things, car payments, student loans, credit cards, mortgages, alimony, children, and yes, even man's best friend, your dog Fluffy.
I know this isn't popular, but I'm not here to bomb chapped lips. The Maricopa County Animal Control Shelter in Phoenix is known as Slaughterhouse Central, routinely killing hundreds of animals every week because pet owners are morons. One of the most common reasons innocent dogs are surrendered and killed 24 hours later. We can't afford him. Duh, but I betcha can afford that iPhone 14 Hachamp. Too many people go stupid blind when they see a cute snout, and suddenly they can't cognitively connect that dogs need feeding, training, grooming, walking, medicating, vaccinating, and toys. Nope, he is just so cute. And bam, thousands of sweet, adoptable pets end up at Animal Auschwitz, all because of rampant human stupidity. My point is this, responsibility necessitates consumption. Stack extemporaneous responsibility into life and consumption is mandated. And the script loves consumption. Threat char fear. A real fuck this event fears nothing. An epiphanic AFT understands that the world doesn't end when you lose your job. However, you'd never guess it by how many people remain in jobs they hate. Deep down, they are consumed by fear. Fear of the unknown, humiliation, failure, and gossiping friends. Fear of being left behind, driving a shitbox car and going without the latest. Fear of poltergeist clowns. All unreasonable, overestimated, and fully incapacitating. Whatever fear prevents commitment, ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? And if it does, will it end your world? Is it life-threatening? Will you go blind or lose a limb? Underneath unreasonable fear is an unreasonable expectation of the consequences. Having to live with your parents for a few months isn't so bad. Working the fryer at Wendy's isn't a death warrant. Missing the latest episode of The Walking Dead is not the end of the world. You will survive. Awakening the dream. My dreams resurrected on a cold, blustery day, stranded on the shoulder of State Route 12. I can't explain what happened. Perhaps it was the suicidal thoughts or the trauma of hitting rock bottom. Although I studied entrepreneurship for years, I didn't transform from aspiring to being until my fuck this event. Commitment swallowed interest. In my case, fear washed away. And mediocre comfort turned to pain. I had enough of the name. In the end, my FTE helped me see that I wasn't born a loser, but born a chooser. I was as I chose. That evening, I confessed every circumstance in my life, my job, my finances, my environment, my business failures, was simply threaded to my choices. From that day forward, I took responsibility. I started thinking about how I thought and how I chose. Several months after my FTE, with no fear, I abandoned Chicago and moved across the country to Phoenix, Arizona. I traveled light, a mere $900, a rusty bick, and a few personal belongings. I committed to entrepreneurial success and would do anything to make it happen and that limousine job would be the last job I ever had. My last paycheck. My last boss. My last Monday through Friday. In hindsight, awareness followed by a profound fuck this event marked an inauguration, the day my dreams rebirthed from a mathematical impossibility to a profound probability. I detail my early entrepreneurial days in my first book, The Millionaire Fast Lane Dot. One of my haters recently accused me of selling a dream. 
जी वाई आर अनोनिमस इंटरनेट जीनियस इज लिविंग इन एटिक्स सो परसेप्टिव एज फॉर सेलिंग अ ड्रीम दैट्स एग्जैक्टली वॉट आई एम डूइंग यू सी मोस्ट पीपल लिव देयर लाइफ वाई स्टॉक्ट बाय डार्क शेडोज द रॉटिंग कोर्पसेस ऑफ देयर डेड ड्रीम्स दोज शेडोज मटेरियलाइज अर्ली इन लाइफ Usually, right after your teachers, parents, or whoever told you that's not realistic, and then youthful dreams slowly decay into fairy tales, winning the Powerball, getting discovered on American Idol, or winning some huge lawsuit because hot coffee spilled on your lap. Want to know why everyone is so miserable? The answer is simple: they have given up. people who say he is selling a dream don't have proxy to anything but their own mediocrity it's like playing poker with transparent cards the hand is dead by the flop so why bother trying no nope, just fold meanwhile your life is big blinded to the pot while everyone else plays for it yes mediocrity's vast cemetery of dead dreams loves company and so do media companies casinos and state lottery coffers what these fools can't see is that pursuing the dream is the dream itself it's the process the failures trials and tribulations it's the self growth the self awareness and the self discovery that occur during a dream pursuit to sell the dream is to awaken the dream and once it's alive you become alive some of the world's great entrepreneurs inventors and innovators live the unscripted dream a few plowing their passions into the world are elon musk lori greenier bill gates arnold schwarzenegger and sylvester stallone a few others in history are benjamin franklin henry ford sam walton and ray kroc Heck, you could even say Jesus Christ was unscripted. The common thread is these men broke the rules for their time. They didn't stick to the script or cave to cultural norms. However, don't let the famous names and transcendent biographies scare you. You don't need to father a religion or be the richest man on the planet to unscript. Once you have the formula. unscripted can be anything minus the notoriety and definitely minus the crucifixion you won't need a startup with 20 dollar million in series a funding or an instagram account with 10 gazillion devout followers what you do need is better probabilities and a better system to fight the fight while the scripted os is the bear in battle We have a secret weapon that can change our odds the unscripted entrepreneurial framework Let's get to executing a change that changes results An extraordinary life will require an extraordinary story Whenever hardships failures and struggles are encountered you are simply drafting the story Part 4 The escape the unscripted entrepreneurial framework 3 b m p f k 4 d b t a f t e art 4 authors objective execution representing the bulk of the book the objective is to give you the entrepreneurial blueprint for executing an unscripted life detailing both internal mental and external actions processes Chapter 15 The unscripted entrepreneurial framework QNF It is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all in which case you have failed by default JK Rowling author Want success Study failure In 2007 Right before I sold my company for the second time, I started an entrepreneur forum focused on real entrepreneurship. And by real I mean businesses of innovation and creation, 
नॉट टर्न की बिजनेसेस सच एज सेलिंग नेटवर्क मार्केटिंग क्रैप और हॉकिंग टी स्प्रिंग शर्ट्स ऑन फेसबुक फॉर द नेक्स्ट सेवन इयर्स आई डेडिकेटेड माय सो कॉल्ड रिटायरमेंट टू ब्रेकिंग द स्कर्ज ऑफ मीडियोक्रिटी डू नथिंगनेस एंड एंटरप्रेनरियल मास्टरबेशन ड्यूरिंग दिस टाइम आई हैव सीन थाउजेंड्स perhaps millions of wannabe entrepreneurs come and go most jubilantly proclaim independence from the 9 to 5 only to disappear 24 hours later surely back to their cubicle comforts the hot video game or some tmz celebrity gossip others stay for years and appear to walk the talk believers of their own delusions they gibber about business the newest motivational video or the latest ipo story but they never do anything they see believe and understand the theology but they don't live it caught in a perpetual paralysis by analysis these wanderers consume the forum like a drug creating progress illusions reading book after book posting inspirational mem after mem while accomplishing nothing then there are the brave souls who act and document their failures giving the community a great gift we learn from their failings and accelerate our own learning curve because i interact weekly with thousands of entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs i have insight into their thinking and more importantly how they don't think This is important with success because a survivor bias reigns supreme. Studying success isn't very helpful. We should be studying failures. Despite paradigm shifts, most people still feel lost. Where do I start? What should I do? What do I learn? How do I find ideas? What this? What that? so i challenged myself if i could architect a master blueprint something that would give entrepreneurs a distinct advantage for succeeding at life liberty and entrepreneurship what would it be after spending many years at my forum and in the scripted world i identified five essential processes critical to unscripted and creating an awe inspiring life few dream of having The unscripted entrepreneurial framework or QNF is the result. The unscripted entrepreneurial framework QNF. The unscripted entrepreneurial framework or QNF can be portrayed pictorially, mathematically or chronologically. Whichever your preference, QNF is a five-phase progression of both thought and action, both uniting in a series of macro and micro processes because entrepreneurship is a competitive sport the framework provides an advantage over those who don't have it the unscripted framework is transparently impartial it helps success but it can also identify low sci of failure by paying attention for the last 25 years i have reverse engineered hundreds perhaps thousands of entrepreneurial successes and failures the framework underwrites all of them including my own if successful entrepreneurship had dna it would look like qnf under a microscope and many of these successes aren't advertised in the trendy entrepreneur max for example there is kevin gue Kevin owns a successful product based e-commerce company. Some days he works 3 hours, some 10, some none. Despite his busy company, Kevin has globe trotted the world from Antarctica to Iceland to Peru. Kevin's unscripted abundance is travel. 6 months out of the year, Kevin is on a plane to some exotic destination. You probably never heard about Kevin but that doesn't change anything he is perfectly unscripted despite being raised in an Asian family that demands script allegiance from a STEM career In 2013 
Kevin bought his father a brand new Lexus. And now, Kevin's father is on board with his unscripted lifestyle. Then there is Steven Van Kovenberg. Raised by a single mother, Steven's dream was simple, escape the rundown and ragged one-bedroom apartment. The antiquated school system, which he struggled within, pressed him to learn a trade because he wasn't smart enough for college. Although Steven tried college, he dropped out to pursue entrepreneurship. For a few years, he stumbled around in several businesses before he came across the book The Millionaire Fast Lane, which turned his life upside down. Focused on businesses with high entry barriers, Steven launched into action and acquired $5 million in rental properties and over 125 rental units. He sold to businesses, both for six-figure valuations. Now a multimillionaire, Stephen has dived into more passionate pursuits such as coaching, rehabbing, and authorship. In other transformation, the way Happe read the millionaire fast lane on the heels of a catastrophic business failure where his company was lost in a hostile takeover. For the way it clicked that if he could build a scalable business that wasn't lynched to his time, he could do whatever he wanted, including being location independent. Within a little over a year following the principles, the way built a sustainable income where time for money was no longer required. In less than five years, the way's security business exploded under an unlimited income dynamic. With a focus on proprietary products, by 2015 the way and his family become location independent, financially free, and liberated from a scripted existence. But again, these are just a few stories you'll never see plastered on the front page of some scripted news outlet. They are out there in shameless quantities. There is a Levy, author of the Dasat Power Contractor. Al retired at 48 after systematizing his business so it could run on autopilot. Al explains the dream on his website, appleseedbusiness.com about today, I live most of the year in sunny Phoenix, overlooking a golf course. And when it gets too hot in Arizona, I head to my home in New York by the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. In short, my wife and I are living our dream. We kept our promise to each other to retire from the rush of business before the age of 50 and then to help others do the same thing. And then there are notable stories that might hit your news feed. Like Kurt Sierwagel, the ultra-distance competitor who set a goal to bike every day of the year, a whopping 75,000 miles. As Kurt's story grabbed attention, a recurring question always appeared, how does he afford it and find the time? Kurt's response was from the unscripted realm. He said, I am the owner of Applied Computer Solutions, Incorporated building a company into a very successful and profitable venture requires the ability to plan and execute as well as learning that recurring revenues are much more important than one-time sales. Owning the company also provides the needed income that is required to travel all over the USA to compete in ultracycling events. Untis. Make no mistake, famous or unknown, both groups share a personal anarchy, they lead life, life is not leading them. The unscripted entrepreneurial framework, digging in. According to renowned psychologist Abraham Maslow, self-actualization is a goal every human should aspire to. From Wikipedia, self-actualization is expressing one's creativity, quest for spiritual enlightenment, pursuit of knowledge, and the desire to give to society, 30 The unscripted framework can help you discover your true purpose, 
giving you the freedom, the choice, and the money to do so, without the forbearance of scripted oppression. Frankly, this can be whatever you want. For me, it was writing. For you, it could be a life of politics, philanthropy, or continued entrepreneurship. The unscripted entrepreneurial framework is defined via this 3D diagram. The base of the bottom triangle denotes your fuck this event, FTE, and launches the unscripted process. Moving upward, each variable represents an unscripted component. Atop your FTE, the upper triangle, team DS, are beliefs, biases, and bullshit, the installation of a new mental architecture, which neutralizes the scripted OS. The three intersecting circles, the Venn diagram, represent entrepreneurship, containing three variable components, FE, MP, and K. The top triangle, 4D, represents the four unscripted disciplines. The topmost part of the triangle constitutes the unscripted afterlife or self-actualization. Defined by mathematics, the framework looks like this. The unscripted framework, team B, MP, Feke, Char, D, Bata, F, T, K. Or vocalized, team B, intersect, MP, intersect, Fe, intersect, K, intersect, Char, D, divided by F, T, K. FTE is a Boolean value, it's either true, ek, or false, shuni. Yeah, a fake, false, FTE creates a division by zero. Aside from giving mathematicians a conniption, it also invalidates the process. If you failed math, don't worry. This is as mathematical as we get. As for each variable, we will dive into each in the next chapters. For those who like things nice and orderly, QNF has a six-legged stair progression dot step eight FTE. Step do teen B. Step teen MP. Step char fe. Step panch K. Step che char D. Result unscription where life changes, the entrepreneurial G-spot. Regardless of the framework's presentational style, unscripted occurs when all five shapes, the two triangles and the three circles, intersect in the middle and ascend towards self-actualized unscripted. Hitting this five-point paint intersection is figuratively the entrepreneurial G-spot, it's where life changes. It's where Sunday night no longer feels like Sunday night. It's where you wake up and have already made a day's wage. This is where you hit yourself over the head and ask, why the hell didn't I do this 20 years ago? I remember my unscripted G-spot moment like it was yesterday. I just turned 27 and it was one of the happiest days of my life. And get this, I lived poorly on a mattress in a tiny studio apartment. At the time, my business was growing. I created an in-demand web service and finally cracked a nut on finding customers. After walking to the bank and making a deposit, I walked outside. It was January and the weather on this sunny Arizona afternoon was stunning, warm with a gentle wind caressing the neighboring palms. Meanwhile, 1,800 miles away in my hometown Chicago, it was just another dark day of snow, cold and misery. I took a contented pause, thankful for my recent choice, and glanced at my bank receipt. It was over $8,000, more money than I'd ever know. Now I realize that $8,000 is not a lot of money, basically, it is bankrupt. However, at that moment in my life, it meant not having to get a job for at least another year. You see, that $8,000 bought me one year of freedom. 
freedom to pursue my dream and what mattered to my heart and soul. The truth is, the unscripted dream begins not the day you retire or have millions in the bank, but the day you hit the entrepreneurial G-spot, the day when the script retreats and you no longer exist but live. Microprocess plus macroprocess success. Strip the unscripted entrepreneurial framework naked and you'll find two processes fundamental to its execution, micro and macro processes. In general, a process is an action series resulting in an outcome. For example, changing a blown tire is a process. Getting this book into your hands, another process. The micro and macro processes scaffold the framework and grease the entrepreneurial G-spot, unscripted's birthplace. The first sub-process is your micro process. Your microprocesses are your thought patterns, your beliefs, biases, and your ability to self-reflect. It's how you think, feel, and interpret the world around you. For example, it's how you define money and think it's acquired. It's how you interpret luck and how you think it happens. It's what you think when you see a young kid driving a Ferrari. It's about how you look at your choices and their consequences, assuming you look at them at all. Unfortunately, your brain and much of its microprocesses have been hardwired by the script. Like an infection needing eradication, the script has written your life rules, providing the mental architecture for autonomic behavior and knee-jerk thinking. As a result, we simply recycle old beliefs of parental or ancestral origin without giving thought to the vice behind them. Once wired together, what's left is a long list of lies engineering existence. Throw in a bunch of cognitive biases, proven psychological errors insulating the lies, and voila, conventional living wrought by conventional wisdom. The framework's second sub-process is a macro-process. Macro-processes are repeated and modified actions. The words repeated and modified are critical to results, changing the action from an event, a solitary action changing nothing, to a process, an action chain that changes everything. Macro-processes spin the wheel of cause to effect, effect to consequence and consequence to change. Random isolated actions are not macro processes but important macro events. The latter is ineffective at creating measurable change. Effectiveness occurs only when macro events become macro processes. For example, want six-pack abs? Try working out at the gym once. Yeah, just once. As an action, one workout has zero effect on your appearance. It's a random macro event. However, working out 290 times in the next year, the macro process will give you those apps. Unfortunately, when it comes to business strategy, many macro events and processes are dynamic and change with time. What worked five years ago probably doesn't work today. When dealing with internet time, we are talking six months. Let me give you an example. After my first book was released, a reader complained I left out an important part of my story, how did I grow from 100 users a month to over 600, 000. I omitted certain details because such details were no longer relevant as a macro process. The macro event was worthless. Seriously, does it help you knowing that I spent $4,000 a month at the LookSmart search engine? This search engine doesn't exist any longer. Heck, when I bought my company back after its first sale, Social media didn't exist. Mark Zuckerberg was in high school fiddling with his Nintendo. 
The macro process of scaling an internet company is not the same as it was in 2003 or in 2011 or in 2015. Rules change. Playing fields evolve. This is why many how-to books are ineffective and largely a waste of time, the macro processes mutate so fast that by the time they get into a book or an internet marketer's latest scam program selling at $997, they are outdated and ineffective. The Silver Bullet Syndrome One of the greatest travesties in self-improvement is this notion of the silver bullet, a cherished macro event or that one secret that is error-proof, fool-proof and failure-proof. Scan the bad reviews for my books and you'll read a melange of silver bullet syndrome responses. MJ didn't give me the secret. MJ didn't tell me anything actionable. MJ didn't tell me exactly what to do, how and where to do it. MJ didn't wipe my ass with scented wipes. Translation I didn't deliver the king macro event, the silver bullet. Specifically, these misguided souls are looking for one cherished macro event delivering drive-through success. The clear path and risk-free road. The color by numbers plan where the only thing needed is your box of crayons. Such a macro process does not exist, and it never will. The reality is, most people like these fail, not because they lack the correct macro processes but because they lack the correct micro processes. A flawed micro process materializes into the world as a flawed macro process, hence making them macro events ineffective circle jerking which doesn't build habits or change. This shotgun splatter-like mentality then cascades into a system-wide failure bearing the silver bullet entrepreneur from goals and achievement. For example, engage the world thinking money is evil and all rich people have lied and cheated their way to wealth and your actions will reflect such distortions, producing either inaction or no results at all. In other words, your inside self is defeating your outside self. Written micro processes cause real change, so the macro process can follow. Both are required, and QNF contains both. Additionally, I have made sure that all processes in this book are transcendent, their effectiveness today will equal their effectiveness 10 years from now. After your FTE, the next unscripted step tackles your microprocesses, your team BS beliefs, biases, and bullshit. Change your head, change your results.